Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is EE310 lecture number 21, Laplace Transforms, Introduction, and Properties. This is our first lecture on Laplace Transforms. Now, you've all seen Laplace Transforms in your math class, and that was the hard part because in your math class, the Laplace Transform was just a lot of math. But what it was doing was preparing you for the cool things that you can actually do with Laplace transforms. And I'm going to do my best to give you a good introduction of some of the fun things you can do with Laplace transforms, uh, even beyond our electrical engineering world, because they're used for everything. So we're going to start this lecture off with a short sales pitch. Um, we're going to talk about the usefulness of Laplace transforms, the cool stuff you can do with them, and I'm going to make sure that you understand that you're learning about Laplace transforms for really, really good reasons. Then I'm going to introduce what I call my Laplace transform roadmap. And this is a graphic that I drew, and it shows everything we're going to do in the next few lectures. So every single problem that we work with Laplace transforms is, and as we move into circuit analysis with Laplace transforms, we're going to be able to look at the roadmap and say, oh, we're right here and we're going from here to here. And students have found that it really helps them understand the material when they can always go back to the little roadmap and see exactly where they are and where they're going. Um, if this lecture is any better than any other lectures out there on the internet on Laplace transforms, it's because of the little Laplace transform roadmap. Um, I've really had good luck um, with that. Students have really liked that. So in this lecture, we're going to start off by defining the Laplace transform, what it is, and we're going to show you how to do the integrations that will allow you to compute the Laplace transforms of functions. We're going to introduce the properties of Laplace transforms. And of course, we're going to work examples. Now, as we move into our other lectures on Laplace transforms, you're going to see that I really value the Laplace transform tables, and I really value the Laplace transform properties. In 35 years of industry, I did a lot of problems with Laplace transforms. I very rarely had to actually perform an integration to get the Laplace transform because smart people have already computed the Laplace transforms of lots of good engineering waveforms, so they're in the tables. And what the Laplace transform properties allow you to do is put these problems together out of little Lego blocks. So it's really not as difficult as it may seem when we're doing all the integrations. So throughout all these lectures on Laplace transforms, I'm going to really try to show you how to use those properties and use those tables so you can solve these problems as effectively as possible. What kind of problems? Well, let's start with one of my favorite things, and that's motorcycles. I love this little motorcycle. This thing is like 50 cc's and it can go well over 100 miles an hour. Part of that is beautiful streamlining. Um, this thing goes through the air like a fish goes through water. It disturbs a little bit of air and then after it's gone through it, the air is just left undisturbed. But what I'm going to focus on in this lecture is this little rascal down here. This is what is called the expansion chamber for the motorcycle. And when I was a kid, the way we made our two-stroke motorcycles go faster is we made expansion chambers. We'd weld up the metal and, and kind of hope they worked, and people would tell us what they ought to look like. Boy, do I wish I knew about Laplace transforms back then. Let's take a quick look. This is a picture of that expansion chamber. And you can see here's the engine, and here's the little pipe, and here's the little piece that kind of bloats out, and then here's a little uh, narrow piece at the end. Now, your intuition might say, hey, wait a minute, in order to make this thing go really fast, 
you ought to have a great big end. You ought to have a big free-flowing exhaust system. Well, here's the deal. This is actually this beautiful motorcycle. Oops, not that. Sorry, that's another picture of it. This motorcycle is a two-stroke engine. The engine is up here, and you can see the expansion chamber coming out, and it has all the elements of this one right here. Well, after you've had a power stroke in the engine, namely when the, the uh, gas compresses and the spark creates a big explosion, the piston starts going down and you shoot all these hot gases out the end and it makes a big acoustic pressure wave. And let's watch that acoustic pressure wave. It comes out of the engine, it goes into here, and then it hits this narrow, narrow piece and it reflects back. It reflects here and it comes back. And when it hits the engine again, it doesn't come back as a positive pressure wave, it comes back as a negative pressure wave. So if this piston pops and the acoustic wave goes out and it reflects back and it hits a negative, it gives you a negative pressure wave just at the time that the piston has made its next pop, then I have a big negative pressure area here and it's going to suck even more of those burned gases out. So it's going to really make the engine breathe when the length here is related to the speed of the engine. And that's why engines can have a power band where at a certain number of revolutions per minute, they have just insane amounts of power, especially two strokes. And so this motorcycle hits that power band when it's going just about 100 miles an hour. And when it's not going 100 miles an hour, it doesn't have a lot of power because the engine isn't breathing really well. But when it hits the power band, that thing's gone. So you look at our expansion chamber, and boy, there's a lot going on. We've got a, um, a delay here. We've got a reflection here. We've got a phase shift going on that converted this into a negative uh, pressure wave. We got a lot of housekeeping to do. And when I was in high school, that was really hard to do. And a lot of it was just empirical. But Laplace transforms are going to allow us to deal with these kind of problems with a methodology. And if I would have known this in high school, my motorcycles would have gone a lot faster. But if I was actually going to class in high school instead of working on motorcycles, I never would have had fun with motorcycles. So what can you say? So that's an example with motorcycles. It's the last you'll see of motorcycles in this class unless I buy a new one or something and have to show you. But I'm going to give you um, some non-electronic examples in acoustics. We're going to talk about uh, the acoustics of sleazy bars and clubs and the acoustics of beautiful concert halls. And the Laplace transform is going to give us the tools we need to do that analysis. And along the way, you're going to learn how FIR digital filters work because it's such a natural uh, application of Laplace transforms that it's trivial for me to show you. So let's get going. Sorry, I just have to look at that motorcycle one more time. All right, so in chapter eight, we did our thuds and our boings and our initial conditions, and we talked about transient analysis because we we're talking about steady state before t equals zero. We had our thud or our boing, and then our circuit went to another steady state. And then we got into sinusoidal steady state problems. And we said, oh, for these problems, the transient has completely died down. You may get a, you know, boing, and sinusoidal steady state was the, ah, no transient. Well, now with Laplace transforms, we're going to put the two of those together. The Laplace transform is going to give us the means to handle both 
the steady state, and the transient. And you'll also see that with Laplace transforms, our inputs are not going to be limited by unit steps or sine waves. You're going to see that differential equations are turned into algebraic equations. You kind of remember that from AC steady state analysis. Well, that's another trap door in EE310 where everything's related. Um, you're going to see that a la uh, Laplace analysis allows initial conditions to be handled in a very methodical way that's really a little bit easier than our thuds and boing stuff. And finally, you'll see that the tables of Laplace transforms and the properties really simplify things. Now, let me keep you from st stepping on a banana peel here. Some students say, well, gosh, once I know Laplace transforms, I can just blow off everything that we did with thuds and boings in Chapter 8 or even the AC steady state stuff. Well, that's not really the case. The thuds and boings stuff we did in Chapter 8 is really efficient for thuds and boings, and we'll, you, you'll want to be able to use that on the final. And steady state sinusoidal analysis is so simple that it's much easier than using Laplace transforms. So in the bigger picture, you may blow off what you learned about thuds and boings and use Laplace transforms. i got to be honest, I, I did. Um, but the steady state analysis, yeah, that's here to stay. And for the final, uh, you're not going to want to try to do a targeted thuds and boings problems with Laplace transforms because it'll just be uh, too difficult. As we see so many times, the Laplace transform, or the, our textbook, has the perfect definition. And it says that the Laplace transform is an integral transformation of a function f of t from the time domain to the complex frequency domain, giving big F of s. Let's look at this, because it's just so well stated. The Laplace transform is an integral transformation. OK, looks like there's an integral sign involved. Of a function f of t, that's a little f, and that's a t for the time domain. Oh, a function f of t from the time domain to the complex frequency domain, giving big F of s. Hey, that kind of looks like a transfer function. Function of s? Yeah, you bet. You bet. Um, you're going to see the relationships there. But here, we're just talking about transforming a function in the time domain to a function in the frequency domain. So beautiful definition here. <clears throat> Let's look at the anatomy of a Laplace transform. And again, this is right in the book. And let's start off here. Here is our function in the time domain. And here is our Laplace operator. So the Laplace transform, or in other words, the result of our Laplace operator on time function f of t with a little f is going to be big F of s. And this is our frequency domain function. That's why we have big F. They called it the complex frequency domain um, in the definition. We'll, we'll call it the frequency domain. Um, and it is now a function of s. And s is equal to sigma plus j omega. Same s we've been dealing with all along. And I'm not going to really expand on this that much. And you'll see why later. But here's our s. And here is the integral transformation. Remember up here it said integral transformation of a function f of t. We said, ooh, must be an integral involved. And here's that integral. Um, it's the integral from 0 minus to infinity. 
of the time domain function multiplied by e to the minus st dt. And what we see here is this is an f of s. And look how t gets integrated out of the integral. And it leaves only a function of s f of s. So we're going to integrate t out and we end up with a function f of s. So now that we know what the Laplace transform is, and we've seen its anatomy, and we know it's this integral transformation, let's give it some perspective with the Laplace transform roadmap. So here is our roadmap, and let's go this way. We have an input, we have a system, and we have an output. So we start with a time domain input signal or a frequency domain input signal. But the idea is the signal goes through a system and comes out the other end. So going this way, we're moving the signal um, through um, some system. So input system, this is the circuit, or the room, or the expansion chamber on the motorcycle, or whatever. And this is what the signal looks like when it comes out. Now, let's start off on the top, where the top line here is time domain, and the bottom line is frequency domain. So, Everything up here is going on in the time domain. We take a signal and we push it through a system using this thing called convolution. Don't worry about that. We're not there yet. And it comes out the other end. And it could be um, a unit step going through a second order system and we get our boing out here. Or it could be uh, all kinds of things. So we have time domain on the top. Now we've got this parallel universe here called the frequency domain. And what you may not realize is we've actually been using this for our steady state analysis. And you can see this block right here is called the transfer function. You know what those are. But the, our lower path is our frequency domain. So what I'm saying is that a signal goes through a system, input, system, output. And at any place in the system, I can re represent the signal either in the time domain or in the frequency domain. So what, we, what you're going to see us doing a lot of is down here. We're going to start with a signal and we're going to feed it through a system, and we're going to determine the response. And the whole quote Laplace form te transform technique, though it's really just one of many things that we'll do, is right here. We'll start off with a time domain input, a little, a little boinky of some sort. Um, look, maybe it'll look like a tooth or a triangle, and it'll go boink, and then boink. And we'll say, what happens to that signal when it goes through this system? Remember, this is all just one system. It just has two different representations. What's going to happen? And here's how we're going to solve that problem. We're going to take our little boinky input signal. We're going to take the Laplace transform of it and convert it to the frequency domain. And that's that integral transformation. Then we're going to process it using the s-domain transfer function. And now we're going to get the Laplace transform of the output. And then we're going to go backwards and convert it back to the time domain. So again, we want to know what happens to this signal when it goes through this system. So we're going to go, here's our signal. Get the Laplace transform. Um, operate on the Laplace transform in the frequency domain, and then invert your Laplace transform 
and here is your time domain output. So that's the problem we're going to be working toward in this lecture and the next lecture. We're going to start with a signal, feed it through a system, system, and determine the response. Now, in this lecture, we're going to walk before we run, and we're going to take a bunch of Laplace transforms. We're going to do it um, using the integral, um, using basically this definition. Where are we on the Laplace transform? We're going to take time domain and go boink and get a Laplace transform. And then we're going to say, that was fun, let's do it again. We're going to take a time domain signal and we're going to go boink and we're going to do our integration and get a Laplace transform. We're really just going to do this integral a whole bunch of times. Uh, we're actually going to do a little more than that. Um, we're going to show you properties of Laplace transforms that allow you to simplify problems or take generic solutions and apply them to your specific problem. That's what the properties are really used for. But in the big picture today, we're going to go time domain, Laplace transform, time domain, Laplace transform. Uh, in uh, tomorrow's lecture, we're going to go Laplace transform, time domain, Laplace transform, time domain. And then uh, several more lectures later, we're going to go, hey, we already know how to deal with this. And we'll see all that. So here we go. Here's a time domain signal, and I would like to find its Laplace transform. So my signal in the time domain, little f of t, is e to the minus a t times u of t. Now u is the unit step function. u of t by itself is 0 before 0, and it's 1 after 0. That's u of t. And so you can see that I've taken this, um, this exponential and multiplied it by u of t. That's why, there's, that's why my exponential doesn't just keep going up here, because it's multiplied by u of t. And I get this nice little exponential looking function that goes out to a zillion, but it ends up at um, very close to zero as it approaches a zillion. So here's my time domain function. And you're going to see a lot of this u of t in the next few lectures. So what I'm going to do is go right back to the, my definition of the Laplace transform, this thing up here. And I'm, I've got my... Um, little f of t, and we're going to take the Laplace transform of it by computing this integral. You notice our limit of integration here is 0 minus. So let's just set it up. The Laplace transform of f of t is going to be f of s, because remember, we know that the, um, the t is going to integrate out in the integral. And as far as the integral is concerned, this s is a constant, isn't it? So the u of t, notice how that ensured that I got my lower uh, integration limit correct. Make sure you're good with this, because that u of t said, I'm going to start my integration right at 0. So, or that's where my function starts. It starts at 0. And now, here is my e to the alpha t. I don't have to show the u of t because I have represented it in my integration limits. And here is the e to the minus st that's part of the Laplace transform definition. So here's the integral that I need to evaluate. And it's a function of t. So I want to integrate with respect to t. Let's combine our e's, and we get e to the minus s plus alpha times t dt. And now I integrate by putting my 
minus uh, s plus alpha in the denominator, and I end up with this uh, definite integral. I substitute in my limits, and I have, of course, my constant. And e to the negative infinity is going to be 0. And here we're going to have um, e to the 0 is going to be uh, 1. So I, I compute my definite integral, and I get 1 over s plus alpha. Did we do what we wanted? Yes. We ended up with a function of s. In other words, we started off with a time domain. This Laplace transform operation was just our integral operation. We ended up with f of s. We'd love to keep going, but we want to build up some chops here first. So we're going to do a few more of these problems. Beautiful little integral. Go to table 15.2 in our book. If you don't have our book, go to Wikipedia, go to any table of Laplace transforms, and you'll see this Laplace transform right there in the table. Okay, let's do another problem. We want to find the Laplace transform of the ramp function. In other words, it looks like a ramp. f of t is equal to t times u of t. Why u of t? Because it makes my function 0 uh, at um, values less than 0. And its value here, or what it's doing for me, is it's setting that zero for my limit of integration, isn't it? And now I'm integrating properly um, according to the formula. So Laplace transform of f of t is equal to f of s is equal to zero, of in, zero to infinity of t times e to the minus st. Hey, that spells test. I don't think I could do one that spells quiz. And so now we want to do this integration. So how am I going to do this integration? I'm going to an integral table. I'm not going to mess with this. Uh, I could do this when I was taking calculus, but I don't really, I, I don't see a need to do it now when this integral is in any table of integrals that I look at. So I go to page A18 of our book, which has a nice little table of integrals. And here is the result of that integral. And now I, you can see, well, I'm going to put my e to the, my 1 over s squared out here. And I'm going to substitute in um, my first limit, which is infinity. And then I'm going to put in my next limit of 0. And I'm going to get a 0 and a negative 1, respectively. And I'm going to get my uh, 1 over s squared. Does this look right? Yes. The t, the time, integrated out. Because we're integrating with respect to time. And I end up with just a function of s. Now. Before I continue on, I want to just make a comment about tables. Um, so far in this lecture, we have used a table of Laplace transforms. We haven't used it, but we've derived results that are in it. This one is in it. And of course, this one is in it. I mean, would you expect a ramp function to be in a, in a table of integrals, especially of engineering integrals? Well, if I put a constant current into a capacitor, uh, I equals C dV dt. So a constant current would give me a constant dV dt. Looks like a ramp to me. So I could see where I'd be dealing with a lot of ramps um, in electrical engineering. 
transistor is a current source, goes into a capacitor, yes. Um, we'll also, well, we'll get there. Um, so anyway, we've looked at an integral table and a table of Laplace transforms. You can go to Wikipedia. They have some very nice tables of Laplace transforms and integrals on there. Um, you can go to any other mathy site on the, inter on the internet and find it. I got to be honest, I'm old school here. I use what's called a, CR a, a book of CRC tables. In the old days, we just called it your CRC, and everybody bought it as a freshman. Um, it had integral tables, statistical tables, it had Laplace transform tables, Fourier tables, and it was targeted for engineering. Books about that thick, and I've used that book for 35 years, and what's kind of cool is I've circled all the integrals that are important, and I've cross-referenced them in many of my textbooks. So sometimes, like right now, my integral table, my CRC is stuck in my office, so I have to go to the internet. But every time I go to the internet, I have to go to a new source, and I have to go find it where I know exactly where they are in my integral table book. Um, and that book is only that thick. And I've never run into an engineering integral that wasn't in there. So there's really something to be said there for kind of going old school. Um, they still sell CRC tables. Um, if you want to be cool, um, you could even just buy one from 25 years ago or 30 years ago. It's going to be just as good as far as all this information. But tables are really useful. You want to get good at using them. Now what I want to move to is properties of the Laplace transforms. And what the properties allow us to do is simplify complicated functions down to the simple functions that you find in the tables. Because let's take all the engineering problems we might have to do. You might have to build a bridge. You might have to hang a hammock. You might have to design an acoustic system. You might have to design a circuit. You have a bazillion possible problems. But by using these properties, you can take your complicated problem and go chunk, 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 and turn it into a piece of Legos. And those Lego building blocks are what you find in your tables. So that's the value of the properties. You take complicated things, make them simple, use the tables, and then go back and make them complicated again. So it allows one book of tables to be used for a massive variety of engineering problems. First one is linearity. We use this property in a lot of ways for a lot of things without even thinking about it. But here it is formally. The Laplace transform of a1 times f1 of t plus a2 of f2 of t is equal to a1 times the Laplace transform of f1 plus a2 times the Laplace transform of F2. And why is this useful? Given a sum of terms, I've got this function that's made up of some of this and some of this and some of this. If they're added together, I can use the linearity property to compute the Laplace transforms of each function individually and then just add up the Laplace transforms. So very simple but extremely powerful property. scaling. Formally, the Laplace transform of a function of a times t, or in other words, a function of some multiple of t, is equal to 1 over a times the Laplace transform of s divided by a. So, Laplace transform of f of a t is equal to 1 over a times the Laplace transform 
using S over A. So what does that mean? I'm going to get my Laplace transform of F of T. Forget the A, because the property tells me what to do with it. I'm just going to get the Laplace transform of F of T, and then I'm going to get some F of S from that, and then to accommodate the A, I'm going to just change my S in the Laplace transform to S over A, and put a 1 over A out in front of it. Let's look at our ramp function. We have f of t is equal to t, and f of s is equal to 1 over s squared. We just derived that, but we can get it out of the table if we want. What I want to do is get f of 3t. So you can see I'm getting the Laplace transform of 3 times t. So here is what I call my normalized result, which is just f of t is equal to t. So you can see that in one second, I go up one unit. But our problem is I go over one second and I go up three units. So what I'm going to do is say that the Laplace transform of 3t is going to be, well, a is equal to 3. So 1 over a is going to be 1 over 3. And then f of s will be replaced by s over 3. <clears throat> so I end up with 1 third. That comes from here. And remember, our basic function was 1 over s squared, but I'm going to call it 1 over s over 3 squared, which gives me 3 times 1 over s squared times 3 over s squared. So I did this using the scaling property. Now, what you might also notice is, hey, professor, you made that way too hard on yourself. Why didn't you just say that your 3 was really a scaling constant for the whole mass? and say it's 3 times the Laplace transform of t, or 1 over s squared. Why is it just 3 over s squared? Yeah, it was. But I wanted to do it with the scaling property so you could see it both ways. Time shift. This is a really useful property. Um, especially when we're dealing with motorcycle expansion chambers where it takes a while for that pressure wave to get out of that exhaust pipe and hit the end, or out of that cylinder and hit the end of the exhaust pipe and reflect back. Or when a signal um, in a music venue comes out of the singer's mouth or the horn player's mouth, horn player's horn, and reflects off the back wall and comes back, that takes time. And this is our mathematical tool for dealing with time delay. And so here is our, our, um, our formal um, statement of the property. The Laplace transform of a function of t minus a times u of t minus a is equal to e to the minus as times f of s. So let's put it in English. We have a function that um, looks like just it's f of t, but it's just shifted by a. So I may, like if I shift my ramp function by a, like then I would just take this function and move it out a little bit. See that? That's what the t minus a does. So if I want the Laplace transform of my ramp function shifted over, all I do is say, well, here's the Laplace transform of my, my ramp function that I got up here. Just multiply it by e to the minus as. And so that accommodates my shifting in the time domain. Why is this useful? 
because not all functions start at zero. Sometimes you need the zero point for something else in your problem. Why else? Because you may have multiple functions that are staggered in time. Like we have our linearity property that says if you have these different functions, you can just add up the Laplace transforms. But these functions may be staggered out in time. So let's look at some things we can do by staggering things in time. Um, we are already know about the unit step function. The unit step function is 0 at, at t equals minus 0, and it's 1 at t greater than 0. But can I move my unit step function around? Can I shift it like this? Now, like let's look at just this one f of t is equal to u of t minus 1. Well, that means when t is equal to 1, it's really u of 0, so that's when it's going to shift. So here's that function. Here's the function u of t minus 1. It goes boink, and then it just keeps on going. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract u of t minus 2. So it's going to be negative, so it's going to go down, and it's going to do its thing at t is equal to 2 seconds. So this mathematical function is this plot right here. right? It's negative, and it does its little boinky at 2, because when t equals 2, the quantity in the parentheses is 0. So f of t is equal to this little one plus this one. Let's add them up. Less than t equals 1, I'm going to get 0 because i got nothing going on. At t equals 1, I boink up by 1 unit. Here I am. And then at t equals 2, i got to add in this one that went down at 2 units. So 1... Um, um, plus a negative 1 gives me 0. So the sum of these two functions, or in other words, this mathematical equation, gives us this. We got a pulse. So in electrical engineering, do we use pulses? You bet we use pulses everywhere in electrical engineering. And if things don't look perfectly pulsish, we say, looks close enough to a pulse. Let's use the Laplace transform um, for just a pulse, because we approximate in engineering. That is part of the artistry of what we do. So what I've done here is I've created a mathematical function for a pulse, which is really cool, because you're used to seeing mathematical functions that are continuous in time or they're a ramp or something like that. But I'm saying, here's a digital signal, folks. This is the output of a 555 timer. And I got a mathematical description of it, and I can go to town with Laplace transforms. So that means I can put this signal through circuits. So so anyway, I, I just think this is really cool. Here's a mathematical function that gives you a pulse. So let's use the linearity property on this and get its Laplace transform. Why might I want to do that? Because if I can get the Laplace transform of that rascal, I can put that pulse through any circuit that we've been making transfer functions for. And I can see what the output is when a pulse goes in. Tell me that's not practical. All right, so here's our time domain function. And it has two constituents, the goey uppy and the goey downy. So what I'm going to do is use our linearity property and break this into two functions. So I'll get the Laplace transform of the first function and add it to the Laplace transform of the second function. Now, 
for a unit step function, the Laplace transform is 1 over s. By the time we're done with this unit, you will have memorized that. But I go into my table where all the Lego building blocks are, and I say unit step, that's 1 over s. So now let's just apply the time shift property. f of t minus a, u of t minus a, is just my 1 over s multiplied by e to the minus as. Or in other words, this first Laplace transform is just e to the minus s times 1 over s. That's f1s. The second term, or my goey downy here, f2 is just going to be minus 1 over s e to the minus 2s factor out 1 over s, and you got the Laplace transform of a pulse. And you notice how valuable our Legos are, because we said, oh, this pulse starts at t equals 1 and it ends at t equals 2, and it's magnitude 1. But we might have a pulse that starts on Monday and it ends on Wednesday afternoon, and it has a pulse of uh, an amplitude of 300. I only need two things, the Laplace transform of the unit step and the time shift properties. That's all I need, and I can do any pulse I want. And here's my Laplace transform. Pretty cool. I can take that little Laplace transform, and you're going to see later on that I just multiply it by the S domain transfer function, because multiplication, and then I take the inverse Laplace transform and we can see what that pulse does going through that bunch of inductors and capacitors and whatever other linear gizmos we have in there. Our next property is frequency shift. So in this case, we have the Laplace transform of e to the minus a t times f of t u of t, uh, meaning it starts at zero is just equal to f of s plus a. So in other words, in English, if we know the Laplace transform of f of t u of t, then if we want the Laplace transform of f of t u of t multiplied by e to the minus a t, we just replace s by s plus a. Now you look at this formula and you say, Frequency shift, you're multiplying it by an exponential. Why is that a frequency shift? And here's why. It's because if I let a equals j omega, then now this looks like e to the j omega t, or e to the minus j omega t, doesn't really matter. And that is a complex representation of a sine wave. So a practical application of this formula is in any radio receiver you see, where you have your antenna, and in, into the antenna is coming some desired signal, and after they do a filtering to get rid of some um, to get rid of signals at different frequencies, they multiply in the time domain by a sine wave and they call that the local oscillator. And by doing this multiplication, they shift the frequency content of the signal so that it lands in this little fixed frequency narrow band crystal filter. So as an RF engineer, this is an extremely important property. And you may not have picked up that whole example right there, but if you're an amateur radio operator or you're just interested in, um, in radios and how they work, this is the process of frequency translation. And we say that this device, this multiplier, which is a gizmo that you can buy from mini circuits, is called a frequency mixer. OK, so let's move to time differentiation. So with time differentiation, say we know the Laplace transform of f of t. 
Well, if we want to get the Laplace transform of f prime of t, or the, the derivative of f of t, what we do is take the Laplace transform of f of t, which is f of s, and we multiply it by s and subtract our initial condition, f of 0 prime. So the mathematical formal statement, the Laplace transform of f prime t, is equal to s times the Laplace transform of f of t minus the initial condition f of 0 minus. What's the Laplace transform of f double prime t? Well, what we'll do is just do that operation again, and we get s squared f of s minus s times f of 0 minus f prime of 0 minus. So let's see what we can do with this formula. Let's say that v is equal to l di dt. Well, that's a familiar thing to us. We know that that's just the voltage current um, relationship for an inductor. So let's get the Laplace transform of the voltage. So the Laplace transform of the voltage is equal to L times the Laplace transform of di dt. And so that's going to be L times S times the Laplace transform of I, just using my formula. Because the Laplace transform of I of t is just big I, and I put it here. So I can say that the ratio of the Laplace transform of the voltage to the Laplace transform of the current is equal to SL. And that, of course, is the impedance of the inductor. Our next property is the integration property. And it's pretty similar to the differentiation property. So I'm not going to give you a specific example. But the property is that the Laplace transform of the integral of f of x dx is going to be 1 over s times big F of s. So if I know the Laplace transform of f of x, then I can just put its Laplace transform right here. And to represent the integral, I just divide that by s. Our next property is the time periodicity pro property. So let's set this up by saying that we have this little function here. And it's kind of a funny little function, kind of looks like a tortoise to me. But what I want to do is I know the Laplace transform of my function all by itself. But I want to know the Laplace transform of what this would look like if I had a periodic train of these. Of course, I couldn't use my Laplace transform formula because the time domain content goes out to infinity. So it could be kind of hard to do my integration. But what I can do is say that if I'm going to repeat this function at this integral t, all I need to do is get the Laplace transform of this function and then divide it by 1 minus e to the minus s t, where t, of course, is the period. And so this is a bridge between the thuds and boings of chapter 8 and steady state, because thuds and boings, we have something that is not periodic but steady state is. So let's do an example with this. Here is one little snippet of a sine wave. It's actually precisely one period of a sine wave. So I'm going to say that this function represented mathematically, we can use our unit step functions to help us here. We can say that this is equal to f of t is equal to sine omega t times u of t. That is my function that goes up at t equals 0 minus u of t minus the period. So see how I have one unit step function going up 
and then I have one step function going down, just like I had up above, several pages above. So I end up with just one period of this sine wave. So what let's do is we want to make this periodic. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get the Laplace transform of one period. Then we are going to divide it by 1 minus e to the minus st and say that is the Laplace transform of a sine wave. And then we're going to go to the table and say, hey, table, what's the uh, Laplace transform of a sine wave? And we're going to see that they agree. OK, so here is our mathematical formula for one period of a sine wave. To get the Laplace transform, I'm going to integrate from 0 to t. You remember that the formula says go from 0 to infinity. But I know that I have nothing out here. So I only have to integrate from 0 to t. right? I don't need to integrate from 0 to infinity because I know I have nothing after t. So 0 to t, sine omega t, e to the minus st dt. Of course, the e to the minus st is part of our Laplace transform formula. And of course, we know that t is going to integrate out, and we're going to get left with a function of s. And so I'm going to go to page A19 in our book and get this integral right here. And here it is. So here is my integral. I just need to put in my limits. So here we'll do that. I have e to the minus st will substitute in um, t here. And I get s times sine omega t. Well, at t, I know that my sine is going to be 0. So I'm going to go to 0. And my cosine is going to go to 1. And now let's set t equal to 0. So my e to the minus st becomes a 1. And then I have minus s times the sine of 0. That's going to be 0 again, minus omega times the cosine of 1 which the cosine of 0, which is going to be 1. So I substitute that in, put it into my formula, simplify a little bit, and here is the result I get. So this is the Laplace transform of one period of a sine wave. So now what let's do is let's make it periodic by just dividing by 1 minus e to the minus st. Or in other words, the Laplace transform of the periodic function will be the Laplace transform of our snippet divided by 1 minus e to the minus st. So here we go. We have our Laplace transform of our snippet multiplied by, I'm sorry, divided by 1 minus e to the minus st. These two factors cancel, and we end up with omega divided by s squared plus omega squared, which you'll find right in the table of Laplace transforms. So this is kind of our bridge between steady state and transient response. Now I'd like to give you an example of actually using the Laplace transform properties. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a pretty ugly looking um, time domain function here. I've got a derivative in here, and I've got t, e to the minus t, cosine t. Um, looks like I'm given an initial condition because I've got a derivative. That all sounds good to me. And I want to get the Laplace transform of that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this thing down so that I can take a simple Laplace transform. In other words, I'm going to take this Lego approach, because this is a very specialized function. But 
I want to use my small handbook full of uh, Laplace transforms and properties. When I do a problem like this, I really need a roadmap. I need some guidance. And here's your guidance right here on the right side of the paper. What we're going to do is we're going to simplify f of t, because f of t can definitely use some simplification. We're going to simplify it down to a really simple little f of t. Then we're going to take a simple Laplace transform, and then we're going to basically undo all these operations that we did. So we'll start with a complicated f of t. We'll do a bunch of operations in the time domain. Then we'll take a simple Laplace transform. Then we will take the, the uh, modifications that we made in the time domain and use them to modify what we got in the frequency domain. So simplify f of t, take a simple Laplace transform, and then modify f of s. So here we go. I see that I have a different uh, derivative here, and I have a initial condition. So I'm going to use the time differentiation property. And I'll just state the property. It's df dt. The um, equivalence here is it will relate in the frequency domain is f f of s minus f of 0, and f of 0 is 0 um, because of the initial condition that we were given. So what I'm going to use is, at first, g of t was this big ugly expression. But here, I'm going to say that my time domain expression that I'm working with, that I'm breaking down, is simplified. It's now just t e to the minus t cosine. It doesn't have the d dt on it. But I have to remember when I'm down in the frequency domain to uh, make this accommodation of multiplying by s. Easy enough. Okay, so now I've broken my, I've simplified my function by getting rid of the derivative. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this t. And for that, I'll use the frequency differentiation property, which says t f of t is minus the derivative with respect to f of s. So since I see t times some function of t, I'm going to say I'm going to break my, well, what I call my g of t here. I'm going to get the t out of there and say g of t is just e to the minus t cosine t. And then I will remember to take that derivative when I'm in the frequency domain. So now g of t just got even easier. It's now just e to the minus t cosine t. No t there. Now I will use the frequency shift property and get rid of this e to the minus t. And here's the property. e to the minus a t times f t, f of t becomes big F of s plus a. So this looks like e to the minus a t or e to the minus 1 t times cosine t. So my g of t becomes cosine t. I can't simplify it much more than that, so I'm ready to do my simple Laplace transform. But let's look what we did. We started off with g of t being a big, ugly function. And then we made g of t just get smaller because we knew we could, um, we could accommodate that in the frequency domain. So it got smaller. We lost the derivative. We lost the t. We lost the e to the minus a t. And all we're left with is just a cosine. And so now let's do our simple Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of the cosine is just s over s squared plus 1. So for our frequency shift, what do we have to do? Let's go up here. And we'll say, oh, we have to replace s by s plus a. And a was 1 in this case. 
So we'll just say s is going to be s plus 1. And this s becomes an s plus 1. So it's s plus 1 squared plus 1. Multiply it out, make it a little prettier. Now let's do our next, our next modification. Let's accommodate the frequency differentiation. Looks like we have to take the derivative with respect to s and then multiply it by negative 1. And so we do that, and we end up getting this result right here. In other words, this result is this formula um, multiplied by negative 1, and we take the derivative with respect to s. The final thing we're going to do is accommodate this time differentiation. And all we have to do there is just multiply by s. So we come down here, and this formula, we just put another s in, so we have s squared now. And now I have the Laplace transform of my big function here. I broke it down into the smallest time domain function I could. Then I backed my way out by putting in the corresponding modifications I needed to in the frequency domain, and I followed my little map right here. So that's just an example of using the properties. Properties can kind of mess students up because you're used to seeing this equals this, but the properties tell you how you can modify a function in one domain and what that modification does in the other domain. So it's kind of an equivalence thing, but it's not an equal sign like in an equation you're used to. So do some examples of this. This is kind of a little roadmap that works for me, but different people have different ways of doing this. So if this doesn't work for you, um, you may find something else out there that um, you know will lock right in with how you think. Now we want to get to operations on frequency domain functions that provide information about the time domain behavior. And let's put this on the Laplace transform roadmap before we do it. So we'll go all the way up to the Laplace transform roadmap. This lecture up to now, we've been taking time domain functions and getting Laplace transform. Bink, bink, bink. We just used the properties of Laplace transforms to get the time domain of a particularly ugly um, um, time domain waveform. And we did that with the properties. We start with an ugly time domain waveform, and we kind of got an ugly S domain waveform, but the properties made it all simple for us. Now what I want to do is I just want to take a peek at going this way. Or in other words, if I have a Laplace transform, I want to know what it's like in the time domain. If I have a Laplace transform, I can go backwards to the time domain, but I'm showing that over here. I could show it here if I wanted, but um, I showed it over here. And there's a procedure that we're going to use in the next lecture where if we have an s domain function, we can end up with a time domain function. But what I'm going to show you now is how to um, you take your Laplace transform or your s domain functions and find the time domain value not anywhere, not anywhere, not as a function of t, but at t equals 0 and t equals infinity. So we have an s domain function, and I want to know what its time domain equivalent is at 0 and time equals infinity. So we're not going to compute a function. We're going to compute a couple of values. And you might say, why do that? 
And the reason is, in control systems, it's very important to know what's going on at time equals zero and what's going on at time equals infinity. So we have these, sne these sneaky little paths that allow us to calculate those two time values very easily. So let's do it. So we call these operations on frequency domain functions or operations on S domain functions that provide information about the time domain behavior. They don't fully specify it because they're not going to give us a function of time. They're just going to give us the value at t equals zero and t equals infinity. So the value at t equals zero we get with what's called the initial value theorem. And the initial uh, value theorem says the time domain value, little f, at t equals zero is equal to the limit as s goes to infinity of s times f of s. So I know f of s, but I want to know what that relates to at time equals zero in the time domain. Take the limit as s goes to infinity of s times f of s. And the final value theorem, kind of similar. I want to know what the time domain function is at t equals infinity. It's going to be the limit as s goes to 0 of s times f of s. So s times f of s is the same for both of these. But to get the, um, the time domain value at infinity, you put in s equals 0. To get the time domain value at 0, you take the limit as s goes to infinity. Now, you might say, that's kind of weird. How come at t equals 0, you don't substitute in s equals 0? Because the time domain and the frequency domain are reciprocals of each other. Just another of our little trap doors in EE310. So I'm not going to expound on that. But um, I, I do want you to remember that for the initial, initial value, you have to set s, take the limit as s goes to infinity. So these are very useful, but let's do a little bit more background first. So for the final value to hold, or in other words, for f of t equals infinity to be some finite value, the function has to converge to a constant value. Like with our steady with our thuds and boings problems, we had steady state at time equals zero minus thud or boing at time equals zero, but then it settled down to a steady state value. That steady state value is f of t equals infinity. So the function has to converge to a constant value. And in our textbook, it notes that all the poles have to be in the left-hand plane. Um, and you can look at that in terms of the, the uh, multiplying exponential. That's e to the minus at. And if that minus at, um, if a is, is positive, then it's going to go to zero as t equals goes to infinity. If it's negative, it's going to go to infinity. The reason that sounded inverted was because there's a negative sign in there. So we're not going to go into that in a lot of detail, but let's just look at two functions. For this function, we have a nice little boinger, and it just converges right nicely to a value. So the final value theorem is going to hold here. Now let's look at <clears throat> this waveform. Here, it kind of goes up, but then, boy, it just keeps on wiggling. The final value theorem would not hold here. The initial value theorem would hold in both places, but the final value theorem doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is that in this case, not all the poles are in the left-hand plane. 
in reality, this one has a pole right on the J omega axis. How do I know that? Because my envelope isn't getting smaller and it isn't getting bigger. So it's got to be right on the J omega axis. A lot of trap doors in EE310. Okay, so now we're going to find the Laplace transform of this function right here. And you can see we got a cosine, we got an exponential. Looks like the linearity property is going to help us because we can get the Laplace transforms of these two functions independently. Starts at zero, so that's good. We like that. Um, and that's our u of t right here. But let's see whether this is going to converge. Let's see whether we want to use the final value theorem with this problem, or would we use the final value theorem? Well, I know that this exponential term is going to go to zero at time equals infinity. But at time equals infinity, this cosine is just going to keep on doing its little cosine thing, isn't it? And so I can see that the final value theorem is not applicable here because there is the function does not converge. Do we have a picture? Yeah, here's a picture of it. Here's the exponential part. You can see it going down, and it goes right down to zero. But that cosine that's riding on it is going to keep on being a cosine. So at t equals a bazillion, I have no idea what the value is because it's still moving. And what we're going to see is that that Laplace transform, it has a pole here, and it has poles on the j omega axis. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. But we look at this and we say, we just know that the final value theorem isn't going to hold. So let's use the linearity property and break this up into two functions. So f1 of s is going to be our cosine 2t. And looks like I'm going to do it the hard way. And so I'm going to use an integral instead of just going to the table and getting the Laplace transform for the cosine. So here we go. f1 of s is going to be the integral of the cosine of 2t e to the minus st dt. I'm going to look up my integral using my, using my integral tables. And here's my integral. I'm going to put in the, the limits, which are going to be values of t. And obviously, here the exponential is going to pull me down to 0. So I've got a 0 here, minus my second term, 1 over 4 plus s squared. Remember, s is a constant here. And at 0, I'm going to have a 1 here and a 0 here. So I end up with just an s. And I have s over 4 plus s squared. Now, what I might encourage you to do is go into your, your uh, Laplace transform table and get your entry for the cosine, and then use your scaling property. Because you have a cosine 2t not a cosine t. Make sure you get the same value using um, your table for the cosine and then your scaling property for this 2t. Just a good exercise. Okay, f2 of t is this term right here. Again, we could just go right to the integral, to, or I'm sorry, to the Laplace transform table and get it. But we're talking about doing Laplace transform, so let's do it. It's going to be um, integral 
0 to infinity, e to the minus 4t, that's the function, e to the minus st dt, that's part of the Laplace transform formula. We'll combine these exponents and we'll perform our integration, put in the limits, and we get 1 over s plus 4. Go to the Laplace transform table. Make sure you can pop this right out. You're given this time domain. Make sure you can look right in that formula or in that table and get this in the frequency domain. Okay, so now I have big F1 and big F2. They are right here. Here's F1, here's F2. Um, let's combine them together so they look a little bit a little bit nicer. So we're going to do a little bit of algebra here. And this is what we end up with. So I'm given this Laplace transform. And I want to know the value of f of t at t equals 0. So say we're given this. Well, we know what the value of f of t at t equals 0. How do we know it? Look at this. At t equals 0, this is going to be 1, and this is going to be 1, and so it better be 2. f of t equals 0 is equal to 2. Let's see if we can get that with the initial value theorem. We're going to say f of 0, time equals 0, is equal to the limit as s goes to infinity of s times f of s. So we'll multiply f of s, this mass, by an s, and we will take the limit as s goes to infinity. And I look here after I've multiplied this out, and I see some s cubed terms, and then I see some s squared and s terms. All these are insignificant compared to this. And I have 2 times infinity divided by 2 times infinity cubed divided by infinity cubed, and I just get 2. Really? I go back to my um, time domain function. Cosine 0 is 1. e to the 0 is 1. Gives me 2. Everything checks out. Final value? Final value doesn't make sense. And the reason I can tell that is because all the poles are not in the left-hand plane. And I do that by just factoring this, numer this denominator. How do I factor this cubic? <laughs> I use MATLAB. I uh, recommend you do the same thing. But what I can see is that the factors, the poles of this function, are at s equals minus 4 and then at plus and minus j2. And these poles on the j omega axis are what are giving this thing the wiggles for its entire life. OK, let's do another Laplace transform problem. And we've got this nice little triangular waveform here. And we can see that there are kind of two segments on this thing. We got to go up part and we go got to go down part. So the linearity property is going to really save our butts here because we can handle this one by itself as one integral and then we'll handle this one by itself. Because we know we can get the equation for this line and shove that into the formula. And then we'll get the equation of this line and shove that into the formula. And of course, for this line, our integration limits will be 2 to 6. Because we're going to say for this segment, it's 0 everywhere else. And then this segment is going to be 0 everywhere except in this little window. So. Let's get the um, equations for our line segments. The first one is pretty easy. Even I can do this. I know that I have a 0 y-intercept, and I go over 2, and I go up 10. 
So that means I went up 10 over 2, y equals 10 over 2 equals 5x. That's easy. Now I get this one. And segments like this always give me a little bit of trouble because I always try to make them too easy and then I get the answer wrong. So what I do now is I just go right to Wikipedia or to the covers of one of my books or the inside flaps and I use the two-point form. It's very straightforward. So for our second, second segment, here are my two points. I have x equals 2 and y equals 10. And then I have point 2, which is x equals 6 and y equals 0. And then I go right to the formula and I say y minus y1. And I can see that point 1, here's my y1, is equal to y2 minus y1, 10 minus 0, divided by x2 minus x1 times x minus x1. Now, it doesn't really look like the form of a line, but it really is. Let's put in the numbers for x1, x2, y1, and y2. y minus 10 equals 0 minus 10 divided by 6 minus 2 times x minus 2. And very quickly, I can see that that is equal to minus 5 half x plus 15. And if I end... So that formula I know is right. And it doesn't take me long to get there. And that silly little trick has really made my life easier uh, here and there. So now let's get our Laplace transform of the whole thing. For segment one, we're going to go from 0 to 2, or 0 to 2. And our formula is just going to be 5t and then e to the minus st dt from the Laplace transform formula, plus my equation here, minus 2.5t plus 15 times e to the minus st dt. So it took me a little bit to get here, but I know I'm right. So it looks like we're going to break this into three integrals because we're going to multiply these out. So. I'll put my 5 over here times t to the times e to the minus st minus 2 and a half times t e to the st plus 15 times e to the minus st. So I've just multiplied everything out. All these integrals are given to you on page 18. You work them out, and you have got your Laplace transform for this cool little function. What if you wanted to make it periodic? What if you had a periodic train of these things? Well, then you would just use your periodicity property and divide your Laplace transform by 1 minus e to the minus s big T, where that big T is the period. Now you got the Laplace transform of this thing if it's repeated over and over again. So now let's get to our last example. Uh, on our last anniversary, I took my wife out four-wheeling in the Jeep, and we were out in the Anza Borrego Park, and we came across this absolutely beautiful radio tower. It's actually just off the um, freeway, off S22, yeah, off S22, um, right near the Salton Sea, just to the uh, west of the Salton Sea. Beautiful tower. Had to get out and take some pictures. So what do they use towers like this? This tower is used or was used to relay microwave signals from Mount Cuyamaca across the desert. So you had one of these radio towers up on Mount Cuyamaca, up here, and this tower that we're looking at would be a relay station. It would actually have another transmitter on the other side. And so what it would be doing is taking maybe a couple of thousand telephone calls from San Diego and passing them along 
uh, maybe on their way to Denver or back east or something like that. It's a microwave tower. Um, the microwave radios on these towers these days have been mostly rendered obsolete by fiber, but they usually leave the old microwave antennas up because that's what these actually are. They're actually microwave dishes. So this tower nowadays, I suspect, is mostly used for just cellular and public uh, safety communications for the National Park Rangers. Beautiful tower, though. But let's, let's do a little bit with this tower. So what I'm going to do is from Mount Cuyamaca, I'm going to transmit a pulse. And when I transmit that pulse, it's going to leave the tower at Mount Cuyamaca, and then it's going to have a direct path right down to our receiver on the floor of the desert. And I can look at what's happening on that direct path. Here's my transmitted waveform, and the pulse time is TP. So at time equals zero, I'm going to fire off this pulse. And if I look at my receiver at the I'm going to see a pulse that is scaled by whatever path loss I get on the direct path. I'll call that AD. And it's going to be shifted in time by this delay of tau. So that's what I'm going to see at my receiver due to the direct path. But between these two paths, there's a lake. It could be Clark. Clark Dry Lake, which is just a little bit north of Fonts Point, and, but I think that that lake has been dry for thousands and thousands of years, and I don't recommend going out on your dirt bike and doing speed runs on the lake because they've used it for experience, uh, experiments over the years, and there are actually some wires down there, and my friend Kevin and I found that out the hard way once. Um, but this signal is going to hit a lake and it's going to bounce off that lake. And so when I look at my receive signal, I'm going to see my pulse that I got from my direct path, the one that came right through the air, and then I'm going to see the one that got reflected off the lake, and you can see my amplitude of the reflection is going to be a little lower than the direct path because I lost a little energy when I reflected off the lake. But it is the delay is a little longer than the direct path. This delay was tau. <clears throat> this delay is tau plus delta tau. So that second pulse comes along a little ways after. So in other words, out comes a pulse. Pop. And over here, we hear pop, pop. We hear two. If there were two lakes, we'd hear Three. Um, so what you receive is not always what you transmit. But I want to get the Laplace transform of the signal entering this receiver. And you just learned how to do that in this lecture. So let's do it. The received signal is going to be equal to AD, because that is the attenuation of the direct path times u of t minus tau, which is this going up edge shifted by tau, minus ad of u of t minus tau minus the pulse length. Or in other words, we're putting our go down unit step at, um, uh, at the pulse width away from where it went up. So we have a unit step going up, and then right here we have a unit step going down. And that gives me the mathematical function for this pulse at my receiver. And you notice it's properly shifted, of course. Now let's look at this one. It is going to have an amplitude of AR, because remember, it's actually going to be, for this reflected wave, it's going to be attenuated a little bit, because in reality, 
this signal in theory is going to heat the water up a little bit with that reflected uh, energy. You're not going to be able to measure it because it's pretty small, but in theory it does. So this pulse AR times U of T minus tau minus another delta tau. So the delta tau, well, you can see it right here. T tau plus delta tau. And so that is going to be this going up edge. And the going down edge is, again, going to be the receive amplitude AR times uh, U of T minus tau minus delta tau, just like this, but shifted over by the width of the pulse, by TP. So now I have a mathematical function of the signal that enters this dish right here. So let's get the Laplace transform of it. And what we're going to do is, first of all, you know we're going to break up the terms, because we have one term, two terms, three terms, four terms. So that's easy. And we know the Laplace transform of the unit step. Hey, look at this. Unit step, unit step, unit step, unit step. Oh, but they're all delayed by different amounts. We got a property for that, so let's just put it all together. The Laplace transform of the unit step is 1 over s, and the um, Laplace transform of a delayed unit step, delayed by some tau, is just equal to the minus tau s times 1 over s. So we'll take this formula right here, we'll retain our magnitudes for the direct and the reflected paths, and we'll accommodate the delay of each one with an exponential term just like this, and then we'll multiply each by 1 over s because they're all just shifted unit steps. And now I will factor out my 1 over s, and it looks like I can factor out at e to the minus tau uh, s from each one. So I do that, and now I have the Laplace transform of the signal entering my receiver. So we're going to see in the next few lectures how useful this is. In particular, what I'm going to show you is that by being able to use these Laplace transforms, you're going to see that what this path looks like is a frequency selective filter. Or in other words, because of this delay, I'm going to get a filtering in the frequency domain. You might remember on our very first lecture in this class, we did the same example with acoustics, and we found that there's a frequency that a singer could sing, and an observer at just the right point in the room would hear nothing. So, of course, there's a frequency response profile going here. And as we dig deeper into the Laplace transforms, <clears throat> you're going to actually see how to use that. It could be a singer singing. It could be a microwave radio signal. Um, it could be the acoustic wave coming out of that beautiful uh, motorcycle that we started the lecture off. It's exciting stuff. So I look forward to seeing you all at the next lecture. I always look forward to seeing all my students at Office Hour.